All right, we had a traffic jam there for just a second. Those inside, you can see that. You know, as we continue in our series, it's all about the gospel. We want to make sure that we do everything for the very sake of the gospel. So just to review what we've been looking at over the past several weeks is the fact that the story of the Bible, in a sense, is the gospel itself. It's the, the good news, the good news of Jesus Christ. We understand that God is sovereign and holy. God is the one who created all things. And because of this, uh, we are accountable to him. And he's the one that determines right and wrong. He's the one who shows us uh, what is the truth. And so God is holy. God is sovereign. Then we also see that God made man in his own image. And that life is very sacred. And that man was made uh, in a state of perfection in a sense. Or a state of holiness. He had perfect communion with God. But then something bad happened. And that's called sin. Sin comes into the world. And when sin comes into the world. That re fellowship. That relationship with God is broken. And then that's the whole story of the Bible. God making a way for us to return to that relationship with him. And so he sent his precious son, Jesus Christ. And we saw that last week that Jesus loved, I mean, God so loved us that even while we were still sinners, what, Christ dies for us, even for the ungodly. And have we not seen some ungodliness this past week as we watch the news? There's some ungodliness. That police officer who for that period of time stuck his knee in George Floyd's neck. There is nothing that justifies that. Nothing whatsoever. And I tell you, it's just a, a shame. It's, it's a horrible crime. And he needs to be punished to the full extent of the law. And all of those who supported that work as well. And I think those are things that are taking place right now. But we have seen a picture of what sin looks like in this world. And, and that's what it looks like. It's evil on display. And it's it's there all the time. And so we saw last week that Jesus dies even for the ungodly. And so just because Jesus dies on the cross for the sins of the world doesn't mean that we're all automatically saved. That, okay, good. Well, Jesus did that. I don't have to do anything. Today we're going to look at what is our response. What is our response to this good news of Jesus Christ? What is our response? How are we to embrace what are we to do about this gospel of Jesus? And so we're going to be in Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10, beginning in verse 8. And I'm going to read that again in honor of God's word, if you would stand as we read this. It says, but what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus... And believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. You will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness. And with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says. Whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. May God bless the reading of his word. Let's pray. Father, just thank you that we can call upon you. It says there, whoever. Lord, that doesn't put any qualifications whatsoever. It's whoever would call upon you will be saved. And Father, help us to understand what this means. Lord, that it's not just a simple lip service to you and then we go on our merry way. Lord, we're to call upon the Lord. Show us what that means today. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. So again, we saw on display this horrible act done against George Floyd. And I tell you, unfortunately, that tarnishes in one way many police officers. There are so many police officers. In fact, the vast majority of police officers do their job well and do it honestly and with honor. And we need to recognize that. In fact, last year, one year ago today, there were what? Law enforcement people who went into that building, who risked their lives to save other lives. And they do that day in and day out. And we want to acknowledge that and we're very grateful for our law enforcement. But in this case, this was just wrong. And you guys know it. You can see it. It's just 
wrong and he needs to be held accountable and and so we're going to look at that in a little detail as we understand what is the the righteousness of god and the, the very justice of god but we also see people who are looting people who are burning things down and we recognize that that's not right either not by any stretch of the imagination that that one evil doesn't justify an, another evil to take place and so again what's the answer in the midst of all of this in fact earlier this week as i was preparing for the sermon i actually wrote this down before all of these things started to take place i just said you know there are people with strong opinions and emotions about things that are taking place in our culture right now and isn't that true whether it's COVID 19 just politics how ugly politics is getting. Are we, you know, racial divide. It says, are we sitting, and I wrote this down, I said, are we sitting on a powder keg of chaos? Is there some spark that's going to ignite an explosion of anger and rage? I said, the racial divide gets wider. Economic collapse is creating anxiety. Isolation is creating fear and depression. Arbitrary rules, it seems, for social distancing distrust of news outlets and the list go on was there going to be one spark and maybe this was it i don't know but we need to make sure that we understand and embrace the gospel in times like this we need to see a spark of revival we need to see a spark of hope we need to see a spark that's based upon the truth of the word of god today is actually pentecost sunday you know, this was the day, when you read in the book of Acts, the birthday of the church. The Holy Spirit descends and the church is formed and birthed, something the world had never seen before. And the church is continuing to grow and we want to see the church grow and we may look around our culture and we don't see Christianity growing. But Christianity is growing because guess what? The gospel is being proclaimed with power. And so we want to say, we remind ourselves today that the gospel of Jesus Christ, the gospel of Jesus Christ has the power to save all, to save all, all who? All who confess with their mouths. All who confess with their mouths. This salvation is free to those that will receive it. This salvation is there for all. The Apostle Paul says it this way, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. Now notice, confess. Confess simply means to agree that, that Jesus is Lord. To agree that He is sovereign and holy. Now a lot of people think that, well, I confess Christ as my Savior. I, I said a little prayer some time ago, and, and yeah, I'm good to go. I said that prayer, and that's it. Is that what it means to confess Jesus as Lord? To say that Jesus is Lord? We're going to look at that. And in verse 10 it says, And with the mouth what confession is made unto salvation. There's some speaking we have to do. He, he notice he said, It's your, your mouth. Now, how many of you, your mouth gets you in trouble? <laughs> your mouth can, uh, sometimes your mouth is connected straight to your brain and there's no filter and whew, your mouth just, it just goes right out. So your mouth, okay, I'm, I'm going to point out who said, yeah, that was a problem. But no, it's a, we have to be careful. But with our mouths, guess what? We are to confess Jesus as Lord. We have to verbalize it. Guess what? Because God verbalized his love for us. He gave us his word. In fact, if you go back to verse 6, it says, well, what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth, and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. Speaking here in Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 14. It talks about the fact that the word was near them. Moses is on his way out. Moses is preparing the people for going into the promised land. He's given them his last instructions. And he says, the word is near you. And think about in our culture right now. The word is near. Right here in this room, uh, whether you're in the car and you're listening over the, the radio. Or you're watching by Facebook Live or on YouTube when you... And this will be posted there. The word is near right in this moment. You don't have to climb some high mountain to get it. You don't have to go to the depths of the ocean to find it. 
You don't have to go searching somewhere. It, the word is near. And Paul was reminding them of that. He says his word is near. It's right here. It's in your mouth. It's in your heart. What are we going to do with that? Because he points out that those who are saved, what will confess with their mouths, the Lord Jesus or Jesus is Lord. A lot of times people make this statement and I understand what they're trying to say. But technically it's false. It's not true. Well, I made Jesus my Lord. Wait a minute. You made Him your Lord? I, wait a minute. I thought Jesus is Lord. There's a huge difference between the two because the first one makes it sound like you're in control. I made Him Lord. He, he wasn't Lord until I made Him Lord. No, no. Jesus is Lord. Now, a lot of times we like to refer to Jesus as just our Savior. And He is the Savior of the world. But did you know this? If you just did a study of the New Testament, that the word Savior as it relates to Jesus Christ is only used ten times? Ten times in the whole New Testament. Do you know how many times the word Lord is used in reference to Jesus Christ? Seven hundred. Do you see a difference? What is the New Testament emphasizing for us? Jesus is Lord. And yes, He is our Savior. Don't discount that. He is our Savior. That's why He came to save the lost. But if we don't understand that He is Lord, then we're just giving Him lip service. That means surrendering completely to Him. It means recognizing that we are subservient to Him. It means that He is in control. Acts chapter 2, verse 36. Again, that day of Pentecost, when they are coming and Peter is preaching to them and they're trying to, you know, understand the things that have taken place. It says, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know beyond a doubt that God has made Him both Lord and Christ. This Jesus whom you crucified. We don't make Jesus Lord. Who? He is Lord. He is Lord of Lords. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 verse 3 says, Therefore I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God says Jesus is accursed. And no one is able to say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. And that's where the Holy Spirit enters. The Holy Spirit guides us, directs us, enlightens us. And we call on Jesus as Lord. And then in Philippians chapter 2, it tells us this, that every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now every tongue is everyone, every human being. Heaven, earth, wherever they might be. One day, all humanity is going to recognize that Jesus is Lord. For those that are saved, for those that have trusted Christ as their Lord and Savior, we get to do that now. We get to bend the knee now. We get to recognize that He is Lord, and we get to do it of our free will that the Lord has given to us. But later, the unsaved, when they have to recognize that Jesus is Lord, I believe they'll do it grudgingly because they're forced to recognize who He is. So let me ask you this. Have you confessed Jesus as Lord? And some people say, well, I asked Jesus to be my Savior. And it was later that I made Him the Lord of my life. And, you know, again, let's do semantics here. But, but really, if Jesus is your Savior, He is your Lord. From that moment, let me ask you, are you confessing Jesus as Lord? When we think about the fact, instead of asking Someone, are you saved? Maybe we ought to ask people, have you been made holy in Christ? And that leads to the second point. The gospel of Jesus Christ has the power to save all who confess with their mouths. So we are to confess, we're to agree, we're to surrender that Jesus is Lord. And what believe in your hearts. You see, you're not going to be able to confess it with your mouth in genuineness unless it's in your heart. You believe in your heart. In verse 9, you believe in your heart, what? That God has raised him from the dead. That Jesus is victor over the grave. Jesus is victor over death. We must believe this. And by believing, we what? We trust. By believing that Jesus rose from the dead, we believe that he is able to deliver us. 
He is able to save us from what? The wrath that is to come. And there is wrath to come because God is holy and righteous. It says, for with the heart one believes unto righteousness. We confess Jesus as Lord. And with the mouth confession is made unto what? Salvation. But in the heart what we believe that God has raised him from the dead. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness. This righteousness is a right standing with God. Remember, God is holy, holy, holy. Which means He is righteous altogether. Everything He does is righteous. Everything about Him is righteous. And when we begin to compare ourselves to Him, guess what? We don't measure up. We are not righteous. That's what Jesus came to do. A lot of times we think He just came to take our punishment. Which, that's what he does. He takes the wrath that we deserve. He takes that judgment that we deserve. But guess what he does? He gives us his righteousness. So whatever it is that makes Jesus holy and righteous, he grants that to us, imputes it to us, gives it to us. For with the heart. Notice it doesn't say, to be saved, you've got to do some ritual. you got to do some uh, great thing. No, you're to believe in your heart and what? Confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. And if you truly do that, guess what? Your life's going to be different. Your life is going to be transformed and changed. And that's why I believe when John MacArthur asked that question that way, as I was studying, he says, instead of asking, are you saved? Because people have all kinds of ideas what being saved means. Saved means, yeah, I joined the church. Yes, yeah, saved means I, I got baptized. Yes, yeah, saved means I, uh, you know, yeah, I, I think I'll go to heaven. Maybe we should ask it this way. Have you been made holy in Christ? That's what this righteousness is. We believe unto righteousness. If we believe unto righteousness, we believe that he has made us righteous in his sight. Not that we are righteous. <laughs> We're still sinners. But guess what? When God looks at us, he doesn't see our sin. He sees the righteousness of Christ. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. And so when we trust Jesus, guess what? We will not be put to shame when we stand before God. He will accept us into his presence because of his grace and his mercy that he has done. You know, we must trust in Christ even when things don't seem to make sense. And there are a lot of things in this world right now that don't seem to make sense. Everything has turned, been turned upside down these past few months with COVID-19 and, and even trying to, to get back together again, starting to, to gather again as church. There's a whole lot of issues we have to consider. You know, th things like, you know, wearing our, our face mask and, and keeping our social distance and all those guidelines that have been put out there for us. And we want to do these because of the sake of the gospel. We do it because we love God and we, we love others and we want to do that. But still, there's a lot that's going on in this world that makes us just scratch our heads and wonder, Lord, what are you doing in the midst of this? And then on top of that, we see people who are losing their jobs. We see people who are rioting in our streets. We, we don't get it. We don't understand it fully and completely. And then we see the evil that took place, that what took place to George Floyd. And, and in our souls we cry out, there needs to be justice for that. There needs to be justice. And justice, I hope, will be served for the officer and those involved with that. Because when there is injustice, Martin Luther King Jr. said this, when there is injustice anywhere, it's a threat. It's a threat to justice everywhere. And so injustice must be dealt with. But I think it's interesting. There are a lot of people out there that want justice, but they really don't want God to administer justice. When they get right down to it, they really don't want God to, to really be God and for God to, to really be holy. As I said earlier, God's throne, righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. I came across that as I was in my quiet time this week. Psalm 97, verse 2. And I'll say it again. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. Notice it doesn't say his mercy. It doesn't say his grace. 
It doesn't say his forgiveness. God is holy and God is merciful. I mean, there's no doubt about that. But his throne is upheld by what? His righteousness and justice. That's why Jesus had to die. That's why Jesus had to go to the cross. That's why we must believe in Jesus to have that cleansing and forgiveness that comes through him and him alone. You know, this past week, there was another thing in the news that caught my attention, and maybe you heard about it, maybe not. And I don't even know this group, but I kind of heard about them. There's a Christian group called Hulk Nelson. Hulk Nelson. It's a contemporary Christian music, and one of their lead singers has come out, big Instagram post, and said he no longer believes in God. And he's written all these Christian songs. He was singing all these things in Christian venues and what have you. And he comes along and he says, I no longer believe in God. And we scratch our heads. What? How could this guy be so far off? And I'm not going to go into all the things that he said. But one of the things he said, if God is loving, why does he send people to hell? That was just one of the things that tripped him up. If God is loving, he couldn't rec reconcile the love of God with the holiness of God. And I'm thinking, did you never look at Jesus? Did you never look at the life of what Christ did? <laughs> it is the ultimate demonstration of the love of God. And it's also the ultimate demonstration of the holiness of God. Because God must punish sin. And I find it interesting, the people out there that don't want to believe in hell, that don't want any part to think, oh, how could a loving God send anybody to hell? How many of those people are crying for that police officer in Minnesota to go to hell? How many of them want justice to be done to someone like that? Don't we cry out at different times that even justice isn't done in this world, it will be done in, in the next? We, we, we desire that. We want that. Why? Why? Because we know that it's right. What is God's justice to sin? It's a place called hell, ultimately. That is God's justice being administered. Sinful man getting what sinful man deserves. But God in His grace and His mercy has made a way for anyone, whosoever, for whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved, it says in verse 13. Whoever. So that could be the worst mass murderer. It could be a racist. It could be you know, some murderer. Whoever. Whoever will truly call on the name of the Lord can be cleansed and forgiven of sin. And so as we just think about what God has said in this passage, we're to confess with our mouths, Jesus is Lord. Don't give him lip service. Truly mean it. It means it needs to come from the heart. Believe in their hearts. God has raised him from the dead. Believe unto righteousness. Again, today is Pentecost Sunday. It's a reminder of the birthday of the church. I pray that God sparks revival in his church, in Indian River Baptist Church, in churches around us as we begin to gather together again. That God birth something new in us. Let God revive us as only He can revive us. Our world needs it. it. That's the only way I can really look at this. The world needs this gospel. And this gospel must go forward. There's always going to be injustice, unfortunately. But in Christ, we can see true justice and mercy administered as we walk humbly with our God. Justice and mercy meet at the cross of Jesus. And we're called to proclaim this good news. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you and I just praise you for this time. And Lord, thank you for this instruction to us. Lord, we know that Jesus died for the sins of the world. But Lord, we don't automatically just get to partake in that benefit. We have to confess Jesus as Lord. We have to believe in our hearts that he rose from the dead and believe unto righteousness. So, Lord, I pray if there's anyone here that has never confessed Christ as Lord or anyone that's watching this online, I pray, Father, they would pray this, that, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. 
And I know that my sin separates me from you. And I know that Jesus died on the cross for my sins. And so I turn from my sin and I turn to Christ. I ask that you come into my life and cleanse me and forgive me of all sin. And Lord, if anyone that's their desire, I pray that they would follow through and, and let someone know so that they would confess this with their mouth, what they believe in their heart. And Lord, we pray for our nation. We pray for the George Floyd's family. Lord, that you would uphold them and strengthen them at this time. Lord, we pray that you would comfort them in the midst of this crisis. Lord, we pray for our African-American brothers and sisters, Lord, who are impacted by this. For many of them have similar stories that they could share. Lord, help them and encourage them. Lord, surround them with your love and cleansing and forgiveness, your comfort and your mercy. Lord, for those that perpetrated this evil, we pray that, Lord, they would repent. And others who are doing the same thing but maybe haven't been caught, I pray, Father, they would repent and come to Christ. Lord, our nation needs healing right now. Lord, it needs to come from us as your followers. Lord, forgive us when we get right down in the dirt with the, the world. Lord, forgive us for this. Because if we're truly confessing Jesus as Lord and believing in our hearts that Christ is risen from the dead, Lord, we're going to be different than this world. And I pray you make that difference evident to us. So, Father, we thank you. And, Lord, we love you. We pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. So as we go to this time of, it's a time of reflection. It's not necessarily a time of invitation because we're not having people come to the front, but just reflect on what Jesus has done for you, confessing him afresh and anew, trusting him afresh and anew. You respond in your heart as God speaks to you.